Good morning, Victory family and friends. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we rejoice and we are glad in it. My name is Paul. I'm privileged to serve as pastor of Victory Church of Charlottesville, where we exist to see people reconciled to God and to each other. And I'm so glad that you have chosen to participate in worship with us this morning. I'm also hopeful that this past Friday you had the opportunity to, to reflect upon and, and maybe even research for the first time the significance of Juneteenth and its relevance to present day discourse. Uh, for those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, this is an opportunity for us to partner well with Jesus to see his will in heaven done on earth and progress in our country in this regard to continue as we bear his image well. I also want to acknowledge all of the dads today. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. It is it's no doubt one of those days that, that brings with it, uh, uh, it can bring with it a range of emotions. Uh, if you've you know, had a, a father or you have a father that is just outstanding and great, or if you've had a father that maybe has not met your expectations, uh, maybe your father is not in the best of health these days, or maybe your father has passed away. Uh, maybe as a dad yourself, you have children that you that you that live with you and you're able to play with them every day and love on them. Uh, or you have children that don't live with you and you're navigating that terrain. Uh, maybe you're estranged from your father. Maybe you've adopted children and are enjoying that experience. We acknowledge the range of emotions that this day can bring. And better than my acknowledging it, God sees you. He cares. He loves you and he values you. More directly to those fathers listening to this right now who are endeavoring every single day to love unconditionally and care for your kids. Happy Father's Day. We salute you. We salute you. And so this Sunday, we're going to continue our sermon series on justice. Justice. First Sunday of this month, we talked about having agency in justice. And last week, we read briefly from Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17, uh, in trying to lay some groundwork for what it means to learn to do right. And we, we said a few brief words about it, but then transitioned to a conversation with Dr. Brackney, our chief of police here in Charlottesville, so that we can learn more and have a conversation about faith, justice, and the law. And this morning, I want to come back to that same scripture, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17. And I want to say a few more words uh, about that, though briefly again, because we'll be transitioning to have a conversation today with Dr. Joseph Williams about faith, justice, and education. And we'll be doing that on our Facebook page where we will stream live at 11 a.m. And so turn with me again to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17. And as you turn there, I just want to pray for our time. Heavenly Father, you're so good. You are so good, as our worship team sang. And, and we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. And I pray that you would open our eyes so we may see all of the wonderful things here in your law. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17, it reads this way. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. The title of the message this morning is Choose. Choose. And I want to highlight three points, again, briefly, uh, prior to transitioning to our conversation with Dr. Williams at 11. Three points. One, pursue higher learning. Two, name the injustices. And three, trying is lying. The prophet Isaiah, whose name literally means the Lord saves, uh, last week, I think I talked about how he was primarily a prophet to the southern kingdom, kingdom of Judah. And, <clears throat> and he, in many ways, in speaking on behalf of God, was telling them, listen, uh, God's judgment is coming your way. But you have the opportunity, though, to choose well. God is sovereign and he's given us a way through that being through obedience and, <clears throat> and his word <clears throat> of God. Excuse me. He's given us a way through. And so Isaiah is saying, repent. Repent and then go the right way. God's mercy, y'all, is abundant. I think about my own life and his mercy and his grace that is so evident in my life. And I am so grateful because I know I don't deserve it. I think even about my own kids and have to chuckle a bit because I'll ask them sometimes to maybe, you know, clean up the floor or something like that. And, 
and, and I'll say it, and I don't want to say it again, like the first time it needs to be happening. And I'm probably giving them some fodder right now as I am to your kids too, sorry parents, because um, they might come back and say, hey, he didn't he send the prophet Isaiah and some other prophets and didn't God remind you a few times of what to do? Why do I have to respond on the first time? And if you want, you can respond with, well, I ain't him yet. I'm working there. <laughs> but anyways, God's mercy is abundant. That's the point. His grace is abundant. And so Isaiah is coming to these folks saying, listen, repent. In verse 16 of this chapter, he's saying quite plainly, stop doing what you're doing. In previous verses, he gets even more specific. He says, stop the performances, the, the prayer, the worship performances. I can barely hear you over the noise of the injustices in your society. I can't hear you over the noise of how you're tearing down your neighbor. Just stop, repent, turn. Last week, I said, I don't want anything to hinder mine nor our corporate worship. And so I'm begging us again to learn to do right. Not just avoid wrong, but to do well, to do right. And so the first point I want to highlight briefly is pursue higher learning. Pursue higher learning. As a high school counselor, I was fortunate to work for a couple of departments over time. And both departments had a really good understanding of the fact that not every student was going to go to college. Not every student was going to go. And yet... Both departments, each department I worked for, they, they, we, we understood, though, that we wanted to prepare every student to have that choice to go. Lest we fall prey to the marginalizing practice of tracking, right? And so there were intentional efforts to prepare everyone to go to college. Everybody would be college ready, and then they could make their choice as to where they would go. We had all these post-secondary plans so that each of them could pursue higher learning in the ways that their passions, their interests, and their desires would so lead. And so all chose and pursued higher learning, and they did so, some through the military, and they were sharpened and trained up in, in ways that maximized their gifts and their talents and their interests. Others through a community college, others through a four-year college, others through trade school, maybe a gap year. And if they could, they'd backpack across Europe, whatever the case was. Whatever that plan was, they were pursuing higher learning in some way. And similarly, though the parallel is incomplete in different ways, but you'll get the main point, I pray. Similarly, each of us has the different ways in which and through which we can pursue higher learning. No doubt we can all pursue higher learning on every front because we are not God and we want to be like God. And so every way, all the time we can be learning and yet for me, there may be some things that for you aren't as uh, high on the list and vice versa. Maybe you've mastered, for example, Hebrew and Greek and you can exegete a text way better than the next person. But maybe for you, uh, uh, forgiveness is like kryptonite. Or maybe you are amazing when it comes to serving faithfully in the community. You 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 serve the, the homeless population, for example, and you can even explain and dissect and unpack the nuance of why this phenomenon continues to persist. And yet your time in the word is quite scarce, such that your community work, though incredibly good and useful and warranted and needed, is just that community service. There's not much power from God to infuse in those endeavors. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 11, for all of us to take his yoke, uh, for us to take his yoke upon us and learn from him. And as we do so, all of us have lessons we can fill in the blank that maybe are more again or higher on our list than are others. I think about myself, for example, when I read uh, about Simon, the Cyrene, I can't help but think about present day time for African-American men. I think here's a brother just on his on his way to church. You can read the account in the gospel on his way to church and wasn't doing anything and got stopped. Forced to do something, had to carry the cross. I think, man, that's a brother caught in a bad situation. I, there's, there's something about that I can relate to. And maybe for you, that doesn't come up right away. But but then maybe for you, there are some things that come up right away that for me, I would need to pursue some higher learning. I need to be intentional about digging in a little bit more in those particular ways. And as we said last week, we're called to learn to do right, not just 
avoid wrong. And this, as we mentioned even the, in the first Sunday of our series, is foundational to our faith. Psalm 89 and 14 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. And as such, it's the foundation upon which our faith is built. So we pursue higher learning, first point. How do we do that? Hearing, reading, studying, memorizing, and meditating on the word of God and doing so in community. And today we're going to bring some community to you in the person of Dr. Joseph Williams. Pursue higher learning. Secondly, name the injustices. There is utility in specificity. Name what you are choosing and name what you're not choosing. God, through the prophet Isaiah, as I mentioned a little bit before, expresses some of what he's not pleased with. He says, the new moon festivals and all of your appointed feasts, my soul hates. Stop it. When I'm trying to settle a dispute with, with our kids, I'm just trying to, to kind of bring them together to reason, which by the way, parents, if you have the code, if you crack that code, pass it on. Like we used to pass on the Nintendo codes back in the day for anybody in that generation. A, 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 B, B, A, B, B, A, up, down, up, down, left, right. If I lost you, sorry, come on back. That's for my Nintendo generation. Folks, if you crack the code, let me know. But it's, it's hard. But we, we try to, to unpack and ask questions and figure out what's the core issue at play here. Because when we can get to that core issue, then if we can name it, then there can be some more learning in that space for our kids. Going a bit further, uh, what I'm also learning is that while I can say, hey, clean up the floor, it's helpful for me to say, uh, <clears throat> pick up the magnets, put them in the bin so that nobody will slip on them. It's more instructive and provides more of a moral than imperative for them to do what I've told them to do. And even more as an aside, the more that I do that when I have those moments of, because I just said clean up the floor, <laughs> which happens, uh, maybe they'll be more ready to do so. I don't know. Again, pass the code on if you've cracked that code. But when we try to get to those issues, it's helpful to name it. What's the core issue at play? And when we name issues, when we name injustices, be aware that internally there may be some resistance that, that rises, just as it does in our children. For us too, there may be something that rises. And what that might look like in this text Resistance, that is, when Isaiah is talking, when he's saying, uh, seek justice, encourage the oppressed. Resistance might look like somebody interrupting and saying, hey, but what about the oppressor? Certainly God loves them. Certainly God died for them too. Yes, all of that is absolutely true. And they have a place in the kingdom should they repent and accept God. But right now I'm talking about the injustices with which I am not pleased. And we can focus on that as we can focus on injustices that we speak to through the word of God from this virtual pulpit and any other pulpit that you also occupy everywhere that you go. And we can do so without suggesting that everything else is not important. It's simply saying this is. And to that end, as we go to point three in a moment, it's, it's important to name it as sin it is to, 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 to ensure that aligned with scripture, that it is a kingdom imperative and a kingdom endeavor. That's important, but it can't even stop there. Isaiah specifies a bit, uh, speaking on behalf of God, that which God was displeased with. And so too can we. Lastly, trying is lying. Trying is lying. Scripture says, seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the case of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. When I was younger, uh, my father, my biological father, who, by the way, love you, dad. Happy Father's Day. You are the best. Uh, he would say at times, trying is lying. Trying is lying. And over time, I've grown to appreciate that more. His point, of course, was, Trying is lying. I don't need to hear that you're trying to get it done. Get it done. Make it happen. Was his point. And I've, over time, grown to see that, you know, trying is lying. If there's something we want to make happen, we can make it happen. I was having a conversation uh, <clears throat> recently with someone on, on, uh, through social media, and we were talking about a particular phenomenon that, that they said was complicated. And, and the more we talked about it, uh, the more I started to realize, and I said, it almost sounds like complicated is code for wrong. <laughs> it's just like code. And we come up with these code words for what is just 
just wrong. And that's not minimizing the nuance and the complexities of situations that have different layers that need to be teased through, no doubt. But sometimes it sounds like when we're saying, I'm trying, it sounds like in my ears, I'm lying. And I said, God, I don't, I don't want that to be my portion. Yes, we're trying to be like you. Yes, 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 yes. I'm trying to be a good dad, all you fathers. And yet I don't want to just try to seek justice, to encourage the oppressed, to defend the case of the fatherless and plead the case of the widow, which by the way, these just represent uh, uh, the marginalized in society. And we'll speak to some of that in our later conversation today. James chapter one, verse 27 says, religion that God our father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Jeremiah 22 and 16 says, is that not what it means to know me, declares the Lord? I want to know him. Do you? I want us to know him. Yes, as I reference, I'm playing on words a little bit. We are trying to know him and we're getting to know him through his word. But I don't want to just try. I want to know him. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. And the good news here is that all we have to be, as it says in verse 18, if we go a little further, is willing and obedient. Whether you have a PhD or a GED, black, white, Asian, Latinx from the from from the suburb, from the urban space, what it willing and obedient. And we can eat the good of the land. We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to be experts, for example, in the color of compromise to lead those conversations next month when we read them. You're invited to join us, by the way. Just be willing and obedient. All of us are probably going to say some stuff for which we need to repent. But if we can be willing and obedient to repent, turn away and move forward as we learn to do right. Oh, God can meet us there. Willing and obedient. And then we can eat the good of the land. And the good of the land isn't necessarily a nice house. It may not be a nice car. The good of the land might be that you, you can forgive more quickly. Maybe you can pray a little bit more earnestly and genuinely for your enemies. It might mean that maybe you, 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 you are uh, committing less microaggressions on your job. It might just mean that you are able to see an injustice and then have the courage to speak up for it. That might be the good of the land. And all that is required is for us to be willing and obedient. The good of the land might just be reconciliation. And I believe we serve a God of reconciliation. And if he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, I want to be willing and obedient to see him show up right now in this day, in this time, for you and for me, for us and our community. And I'm not just here to just try. Because he didn't just try. Jesus didn't just try to, to go into the temple and turn those tables over. No, he went in and disrupted some stuff because it was wrong. He didn't just try to sit with the Samaritan woman. He did it knowing that society would have some issues with it. He didn't just try to call out racism. He did it. And thank God he didn't just try to die. Where would you and I be if he just tried to die? No, he didn't just try. He died. He died. And because he didn't just try to die, because he did. Verse 18 says this, though your skin, your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Because he didn't just try. We have liberty. And there are some folks living on our, living in our house, <laughs> living on our street, working on our jobs. And they can't, they can't breathe because, because of the, the knee that is of the societal structures that are on their necks. And it's begging for us to not just try, but to choose to seek justice, to choose to encourage the oppressed so they can breathe and have liberty and be free. I'm so glad Jesus didn't just try, but he died for you and he died for me. He's given us the privilege, the opportunity to choose, to learn to do right to seek justice, to defend the oppressed, to take up the cause of the fatherless, to plead the case of the widow. Those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, 
all around us are opportunities to bear his image well, to represent Jesus and choose. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to choose. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to choose. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to choose. Every day we can take the next step of obedience. And you've called us to be willing and obedient. Thank you for the opportunity. Use us, Lord. Use us. We confess the ways that we've fallen short. We know all have fallen short of your glory. And we come afresh asking for forgiveness. Individually, corporately, we've fallen short. We, we are not enough in and of ourselves. But we believe that you through us can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you, family. Let's live in victory in a few moments at 11 a.m. Join me over on Facebook Live where we're going to have a conversation with Dr. Williams where you can ask questions and we can dialogue a bit about what faith, justice, and particularly today, education, what it looks like there. Amen. Love y'all.